1982 is the year the one-party state was first legalized in Kenya. And it was the year of the failed coup attempt against the government of President Daniel Arap Moy. On June 9th, to ensure that no opposition party ever came into being in Kenya, Kanu got parliament to amend the country's constitution and make Kenya a one-party state. The government would follow up the one-party proclamation with a series of drastic measures to try and curb opposition from any quarter. There were detentions and jailings of lecturers at Nairobi and Kenyatta universities who had criticized the government's new authoritarian measures. Among the detained academics were Alamin Mazrui, Mukaru Nganga, Edward Oyugi, Kamoji Washira, and Maina Wakinyati. But it was not only academics who took issue with the government's draconian measures. On July 20th, George Gizhi, editor-in-chief of the Standard Newspapers and close friend of Njonjo's, wrote an editorial attacking political detention and calling for the repeal of the Preventive Detention Act that Parliament had passed during Kenyatta's time. Following pressure from the government on the newspaper's owners, the British multinational company Lonro, Gizhi was sacked from the Standard the same week. Exactly a week later, at 3.30 a.m. on the night of August 1st, a group of soldiers of a Kenya Air Force squadron based at Embakasi Air Base in Nairobi seized Kenyatta International Airport. Another group took Wilson Airport. A third seized Broadcasting House. At 7 a.m., they made an announcement on the Voice of Kenya radio that they had overthrown the Moy government, which they accused of being corrupt and dictatorial. It was a coup attempt, but it did not succeed. By 10 a.m., a combined force of soldiers from the Langata Army Barracks and men from the regular and general service units of the police had retaken Broadcasting House. Loyal soldiers took back control of the Embakasi Air Base, and by mid-afternoon, the rebels had been routed. Their ringleader, Hezekiah Ochuka, and three others managed to escape to Tanzania in a commandeered aircraft. Behind them, they left more than 200 Kenyans in Nairobi dead, including many fellow rebels and innocent civilians caught in the crossfire. More than 500 people were injured. It was the most traumatic experience the country had ever gone through since independence, and it would shape the politics of the nation for years to come. By the end of August, Moy had disbanded the Air Force. Out of its former 3,000 soldiers, more than 1,700 had been arrested. They included the commander, Major General Peter Kariuki, they would eventually be court-martialed. The rest were subjected to thorough screening before being re-recruited into a new air force that Moy called the 82 Air Force. To head the new force, Moy chose Deputy Army Commander Major General Mohamed Mohamed, who had led the military operation that had put down the coup attempt. Within days of the failed coup, Moy had replaced the Commissioner of Police, Ben Gethi, with the former head of Kenyatta's Presidential Security Guard, Bernard Njinu. Soon after losing his job, Gethi would find himself in detention. That August, there were arrests and detentions outside the armed and uniformed services as well. And it wasn't a good year for the country's economy either. In May, Kikomi Cotton Mills was placed under receivership, and by the end of the year, more than 1,000 out of 2,500 workers had been laid off. Nearby Kisumu Molasses plant, owned by Kenya Chemical and Food Corporation, collapsed. Indeed, the country was in such a dire economic state that in December, it was forced to devalue the Kenya shilling by 15% in order to cope with balance of payment problems. In 1982, Kenyans said farewell to several famous leaders. 
Minister for Defence and veteran Kano leader James Kishuru, former Deputy Speaker of Parliament Jean-Marie Serone, Masabit North MP Alex Isako Umuro, who was killed by bandits in Masabit, former Assistant Minister and MP Wilson Mukuna, and popular voice of Kenya radio comedian Kipanga Athumani.